Sing. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Amateur of Life and Death podcast. I'm Liz Plumpton. And I'm Luke Plimmer. Each episode takes a look at a different aspect of the wonderful world of amateur theatre and features an amateur theatre maker talking about their theatrical life, theatrical loves and the times when they've died on stage. Our backstage pass holder, John O'Neill, also takes a look behind the scenes at the Crescent Theatre Birmingham to discover more about what goes into making a great amateur production. Today's episode explores musical theatre and the story of the iconic musical Little Shop of Horrors. We'll be interviewing Karen Ledbetter, actor, singer and director, to find out about her life and loves in amateur theatre and her experience of musicals. This month, John will be going behind the scenes on the Crescent Theatre's forthcoming production of Little Shop of Horrors by Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, and will be finding out why you really shouldn't feed the plant. Luke and I are delighted to be joined by Karen Ledbetter. Karen is an actor, director and a member of the Crescent Theatre Birmingham. Hi, Karen. Hi. So Karen's come today uh, to talk to us a little bit about her life and loves in amateur theatre. So Karen, tell us about your first love. Okay, so I think I can, from a a really young age, I've always enjoyed performing. I mean, I was one of those kids that would always get up at Christmas and perform to the family. Um, And I remember when I was in the Brownies, when I was really little, that the things I used to enjoy the most was when they got us into groups to do the drama things. And obviously I like doing school productions and so on. Um, But I think really my real love of theatre, probably in going to the theatre, and this links into the whole musicals thing, was when I went to see Blood Brothers. Um, the fir- it was the first, I shows how old I am, the first national tour of Blood Brothers. <laughs> and I think Mrs Johnston was, being, was played by um, a singer called Rebecca Storm. And I was just absolutely blown away by it. And I just absolutely fell in love with the whole thing. Um, and so I think it's, it's always been there. It's always been in my blood. I've always really enjoyed it. But I think that was a moment that I can really remember thinking. I would just love to be up on that stage doing that. And have you ever done Blood Brothers? Well, no, because you can't actually do the musical. I mean, it's um, it, the rights to do the musical is available, I think, maybe if you're at school. But, um, and you can do the play version, but not, not the musical. So, no, I mean, it'll be something I would love to do. If they ever release the rights and I'm not too old, I would love to, to, to play Mrs Johnston. But, uh, but no, no, I've never done that. So what's been the love of your theatrical life? Ah, uh, well, my, my most favourite part that I've ever played was Mrs Lovett in Sweeney Todd. And I think anybody who knows me will know that will be my answer because it was a part that, well, when the Crescent first did it, I was PA. Andrew Cowie directed it and I was PA. And I didn't really know the show that well. Mm. Um, and um, Sweeney Todd was played by Michael Barry and um, Margaret MacDonald, a wonderful actress, um, played Mrs Lovett and I absolutely loved being involved with that production. I, um, I, I absolutely love the show. I love Sondheim, I love the music, the, the, the lyrics, it's so witty, it's so clever. So when the opportunity came and the Crescent did it and I was kind of the right age, I was absolutely delighted to, to to get the role and it lived up to every expectation it was just a wonderful experience and a wonderful character to play and I loved her I loved her she was great she was mean she was funny she was just a fantastic character to play brilliant so uh, we've obviously touched on blood brothers which might have been the one that got away but uh, tell us about the one that got away this is, this is really quite a tricky question because I I've been so lucky that I've played so many wonderful roles and I've directed so many plays that, um, you know, Shakespeare roles, I've loved doing Shakespeare and musicals and straight plays and I'd like to do a bit more comedy. Um, I really enjoyed playing Nursey in Blackadder earlier this year and it was really fun to just be funny and and do a comedy. Um, So in terms of things that have got away, I think maybe I'm getting to that age, that certain age when roles are a little bit more tricky for women (laughs) to find. So I think maybe I'd like to perhaps 
take some of those Shakespearean roles. You know, those ones that, um, that are the, the male roles that a lot of female actresses are really sort of taking hold now. Things like playing Lear or playing um, you know, Richard III. And, and I think I'd really like to have a go at that when I'm, you know, I, I get the opportunity to. Or if you wanted to do comedy, there's always full stuff. Indeed, indeed, and yes, and yeah. <laughs> we look forward to uh, we look forward to seeing your. But hasn't he got in your last podcast? He's got loads of lines or something, so maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell us about a time when you died on stage. Oh, okay. Um, so I think the only time I've been a character that's died on stage was actually Little Shop of Horrors. I've died off stage a couple of times when my characters, like Mrs Lovett, was shoved into an oven and died. And I was paid Lady M and she dies off stage. But I think when I played Audrey, she actually does die on stage. So that's the only time I've actually, as a character, died on stage. But if you're talking about mishaps on stage, <laughs> there's been a few. There's been a few. I remember playing um, Eliza Doolittle in Pygmalion. Yeah. And it was one of those moments, you know, when you could... We, we were in a scene, I think I was sewing, and it was like a drawing room scene, the sort of second half of the play. And the actor playing Colonel Pickering just completely dried. And you know when you're on stage and someone's dried and there was no prompt, and you think, okay, well, I'm going to try and help out. <laughs> so I, I think I said a line, which then sent us into this endless loop, <laughs> because it took, it took us back to the beginning of the scene, and I think we kind of got to the bit where he dried before, so it was one of those moments. <laughs> And another moment, and again, this links back to Sweeney Todd. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Lovett, when she first comes on, she's got quite a complicated song, which she sings while she's moulding dough, and, and she's got this knife and she's chopping it, and it's all got to be done on time to the beat of the music. And whether or not I was just overzealous in my chopping of the dough, or maybe the knives weren't quite blunted enough, but oh, no. I basically ended chopping off my chopping my thumb mm. <laughs> during the song. Um, I don't think I quite realised it until after the song and then I realised that my thumb was bleeding. I still have a scar. And I thought, oh my God, it's quite a while till I go off stage again. <laughs> so I literally stood for the rest of the scene holding my thumb, <laughs> hoping that it wouldn't bleed anymore. So yeah, I do have the scars to, to, pr to prove it. Wow. <laughs> it's quite yeah. appropriate for the quality of her pies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there was real, real blood in the pies. Yeah. Yes, it was mine, yeah. it was mine. Thanks, Karen. So... Um, this episode, we're focusing in on, on musicals. You, you've spoken a little bit already um, about a, a couple of musicals, but uh, tell us some more about your experiences of performing in musical theatre and what do you think is different about being in a musical compared to being in a straight play? Hmm. So I think the first... I think the first musical I think I did here at the Crescent was Guys and Dolls, um, in which I played Sister Sarah, which was quite appropriate because I used to be in the Salvation Army when I was younger, which is probably where I did a lot of singing. So I did. I was in the Salvation Army until I was about eighteen, and did you did play a lot of as well? Did I play? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trombone. I nice. I was in the girl band in cabaret playing my trombone, which I think is the single most terrifying moment I've ever had on stage <laughs> because I'm not a very good player, and I and yeah. So so the I, trombone I did, did part's play. quite crucial. It is <laughs> really number. crucial. So yes, yeah, so <laughs> I did play. So yeah, Sister Sarah was the first sort of musicals I've done, and I've done a few obviously since. Um, I tend to like the character roles really rather than the juve leads so um we did a version of pa phantom of the opera here um nice. yeah and i played madame jury nice. <laughs> and, um, and i don't remember much about it except i know i sang a song that involved a teapot um nice. i had to make some tea so that was fun <laughs> um and obviously little shop of horrors i played audrey um which was which was really good fun as well um, in terms of the difference between being in a musical and being in um, a straight play, it's a lot more rehearsal. Mm. It takes a lot longer because obviously you have to learn all the music before you can then start putting the whole thing together. I'm not a dancer, I'm, I'm, so I do avoid any parts where I have to dance because it's not... I, I, I'm, so anything that's got any sort of choreography just sort of, you know, f terrifies me. Um, but yeah, so it, that that part of it. But also, it's um, there's a lot more things you have to be careful sure. about. So I remember when I got 
podcast in Sweeney Todd thinking, I cannot lose my voice. I can't have a cold. And uh, it, that would just be a disaster. So I remember sort of taking lots of, um, oh God, what are those fizzy echinacea, fizzy he- echinacea for like six months. I thought, I am not being ill. I'm not being ill for the musical because obviously you have to really look after your voice. I mean, obviously you do when you're in a straight play, but it's a little bit more crucial in, in, in a musical. Yeah. You just have to really sort of look after every every part. Well, you, you know, Luke, as well, you're... you're, you're you know, you're good yeah. in musicals, excellent in musicals as well. Yeah. And if you could only be in musicals or straight plays for the rest of your life, mm. what would you choose? I think I would say straight plays, actually, yeah. because although I've absolutely loved being in musicals, I'm not a triple threat, and I think you have to be a triple threat, <laughs> don't you? You have to be a triple threat to be in a musicals and have a certain f- fitness and physique, which I'm... We should have called the episode of this podcast that, shouldn't we? The triple threat. There <laughs> the we go. Triple, yeah, yeah. So, no, I think, yeah. I think now, for the rest of my life, definitely it would be straight plays. Okay. Because you mentioned um, playing Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors, um, yeah. so, like, What is it about that show? Is there anything that appeals to you about that show specifically? I think it's a great show. It is. It's got such a liveliness, but also a real darkness to it as well. And, you know, and I love that that kind of 50s swing sense to it. Um, I love the characters. Um, You know, Audrey was such a great part to play because she was, you know, she was quite a caricature in lots of ways, but also she's a really... um, interesting character in terms yeah. of her sort of vulnerability um and um you know and actually there's those underlying themes that are in yeah. the musical which i think you know you you don't always get when you think of it being sort of glitzy and yeah, all the definitely. dance routines and so on but the music in it but but i i i think it's a love lovely show um and it's you know, you get that big plant on stage. Oh, that, yeah. you know, there's so many elements to it: the puppeteering, the uh, the great soundtrack, the you know that Ronette swing style of, um, of of that part as well. So yeah, I mean, I I I I really enjoyed being in it. And it doesn't have a happy ending. That's why I like it. It really doesn't spoilers, have a spoilers. happy <laughs> ending. It's you know, well, it is. It's just like a B movie horror, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's it what is. it is. It, it, it's it's a you know, it's a, it's a B movie, and you know. But also there's that kind of, you know, it's got that kind of message, isn't it? Because actually it's greed and yeah. that, that, has, that, has, that has made them, the, the monster grow. Absolutely, And yeah. uh, the monster then is, you know, all over the America, isn't it? Yeah. The, the plant. And so yeah. I think it's, you know, that, that desire for, for, for gr- you know, that greed and desire for um, commercial success yeah. that actually is sort of fed, yeah. fed, fed, fed into it. So I think I, I quite like that. Yeah. Apparently the they... Um, they filmed the the you talk about the nineteen eighties movie, I think, aren't you, Luke? Um, yeah. They filmed it with the original ending and screen tested it, and audiences didn't like it because yeah. it didn't have a happy ending. So yeah. they changed yeah, it. I think you're right, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's like completely different as well. Have you directed any musicals, Karen? Do you know, I haven't. I think the nearest thing I've done to directing a musical was, I mean, apart from school, because I have directed musicals when um, at school, I've done Wizard of Oz and I did a um, um, Bugsy Malone and Grease. So I've done, mus- yeah, so I guess I've done them at school. Um, I've not done one here at the Crescent, although the very first play I ever directed at the Crescent was actually a panto mm-hmm. and it did have dance and it did have music in it. So I kind of, that does, I guess that, kind of yeah. is a musical so yeah i've done it at school but not um not here yeah. not with big people would you <laughs> direct a musical do you think, think and if you so. did what what would it be <gasps> oh. oh i don't know <laughs> i don't know i i always thought that i'd like to do chess because i always really liked the music of chess and yeah. then i went to see a really awful production of it and then I thought well maybe I wouldn't want to do it after all <laughs> maybe now wouldn't be an appropriate time either so <laughs> so no I don't know what musical I'd like to do um but yes I would like to I would like to because I, lo- I love I love them so musicals are some of the most often performed shows for amateur companies in fact many famous musicals will have been put on countless more times by amateur companies than professionals yet they're also some of the most challenging productions to pull off so what do you think is the secret of doing musicals well as an amateur theatre company i think you have to 
first of all, understand your membership and understand who you've got and think and choose your musicals that suit the yeah. you know, the, the people that you're going to cast within the musical. Because I know there's a lot of um, musical theatre societies that you know, have a big group troops of dancers or um, have particular you know age groups. I mean, the one thing I don't like seeing is, you know, when you come to see amateur musicals and the juve leads are not really juve leads i mm. think you really have to cast within what you've got in your membership um doing them well i think it's because things are musicals that you're pulling together so many different aspects so many different sections you know you've got choreography you've got music you've got acting then you've got all the technical because really musicals you know big stage musicals are, should be a spectacular yeah. Um, so I think it's about making sure that, you know, though you keep the, that communication open and that the director is communicating with the choreographer, is communicating with the musical director and that you all have the same vision. I mean, that's really important and that you have that shared vision. And I think as long as, the, you know, the people behind the technical side have the, that shared vision, then you will be you make it a success on stage. Yeah. Musicals specifically and, and amateur productions in general have a bit of a reputation for sometimes having more drama off stage than on stage. Ah. Mm. Have you have you ever done a musical where everything's gone smoothly and nobody's had a had a meltdown, or do you think that goes with the territory? I think I think that often goes with the territory with any large yeah. cast show, um, and yeah, I, I mean I can't really recall it any sort of huge disasters or huge kind of meltdowns in shows I've been in but maybe I'm just a bit oblivious to these things maybe I just <laughs> lock the door and, and let other people they worry about it but but I, I do think when you've got a lot of people and a lot of um oh what's, the, what's a good way of saying this um lots of people that want to be successful yeah perhaps in in the shows that you can sometimes you know maybe get those tensions but I do, I do think, you know, when you've got a large cast show, it, it is, you know, you are going to have lots of different personalities. And, yeah. and also, it, amateur theatre is tiring. Yeah. You know, people are doing it in their spare time. They're yeah. coming to rehearsals from being at work. They're, um, you know, grabbing a sandwich before they go on stage. So I do think sometimes that can add to kind of maybe tensions and emotions. And if anybody is unwell or yeah. they're not on form, it can, it can sort of create tensions. But, you know... On the other side of that, doing it, there's nothing like the final song of a musical yeah. and the audience absolutely loving it. And, you know, and, and you get the standing ovations and something about music, you see, because music has that other layer of, la layer of emotion yeah. and, and sort of gets, in, gets an emotional response from the audience. So they, they've got that double sense of that's been a great show, but then there's a really uplifting piece of music at the end that just yeah. kind of gets everybody, um, yeah. you know, enjoying it. There's this unique sense of achievement, I think, with musicals as well. When you, um, when you, you know, perform it well and it goes well and the audience like They're it. They're hard. They are. They They're are. hard, you know, because you've got to, not only have you got to, you know, remember your lines, you've got to remember yeah. them in time with a piece of music. Yeah. You've got to be in the right space when the music comes in. You've got to keep in, you know, up with the, the conductor. So, I mean, yeah. they, they are hard. And so I think there is a sense, of, yeah, a huge sense of achievement at the end of them. Absolutely, absolutely. Karen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been okay. a joy to talk to you. Thank you very much. It's okay. <laughs> and, uh, we look forward to seeing you soon as a trombone playing cross-cast Shakespearean <laughs> yes. character. There's definitely there's an out, you know a need out there. There's a niche there. There, there is Brunch a niche. Story. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. In 1960, film director Roger Corman was given access to an existing film set for two days prior to it being torn down. He decided to shoot a low-budget horror comedy. The first incarnation of the story, which was developed with the writer Charles B. Griffith, was a Dracula-inspired story about a vampiric music critic. Corman was unimpressed. The next draft, titled Gluttony, was about a chef who cooked his customers, although the motion picture production code of the time made this a non-starter. Griffith recounts, So I said to Roger, How about a man-eating plant? And Roger said, OK. By that time, we were both drunk. Cast using stock actors from the studio, the production was a true low-budget B-movie. The entire shoot is reported to have cost $28,000.
That's still only a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. The cast of the film included a young Jack Nicholson, and this is probably part of why the film had the later success that it did. The premise of The Little Shop of Horrors doesn't sound like the ideal starting point for a successful musical. Doesn't it go to show? You never know. The plot of the musical version, book and lyrics by Howard Ashman and music by Alan Menken, is not faithful to the film in its detail. Although huge man-eating plant exploits down on his luck nobody bringing fame, fortune and love to the poor schmuck in exchange for a supply of human blood and flesh in a Faustian pact is a fair synopsis of both. Originally opening in 1982 off-Broadway, Little Shop of Horrors, note the subtle change of name from the film, was an overnight sensation with both the critics and audiences, and it went on to have a five-year run at New York's Orpheum Theatre. When it closed after 2,209 performances, it was the third longest-running and highest-grossing off-Broadway musical ever. Being an off-Broadway musical meant that the original production wasn't eligible for the Tony Awards, although it did win a Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Musical. A lack of Tonys didn't stop Little Shop of Horrors from being turned into a successful movie, with Rick Moranis in the lead role of Seymour and Steve Martin as the dentist. The film included various cameos by actors including James Belushi, John Candy and Bill Murray. It also had some new and reworked songs and a controversial new ending, which was reshot after the studio decided that they didn't like the original ending, which had been faithful to the original stage musical, Hollywood. It's not every stage musical that gets turned into a film, a much less a second version 35 years later. That's true of Little Shop of Horrors, which has a new film version in the making, and that is, in large part, due to the huge success of the stage musical. Little Shop of Horrors is one of the most performed musicals in the world. When it's not the subject of a national tour or a West End or Broadway revival, it's being performed by companies across the world. Its hugely popular score, featuring toe-tappers such as Git It, more commonly known as Feed Me, and the stunning ballad Suddenly Seymour, is what makes it an instant audience favourite. However, great music aside, the show comes with some particular staging conundrums. So particular are the conundrums, and so popular is the show, that there are companies that will rent out the major props and the huge man-eating puppet, Audrey too. The biggest problem that producers need to overcome is how to do Audrey too, the huge man-eating plant. Over the years, all sorts of approaches have been taken. The original production used four different puppets of increasing size, from a simple glove puppet plant in Act One, up to a huge stage-filling monster that required two puppeteers at the end of Act Two. In order to devour its victims, the actors being eaten would need to crawl into the snapping jaws of the plant and out the back of the puppet, while appearing to be dead. In the 2014-15 Royal Exchange production, the puppeteers from Warhorse built an Audrey II that had visible puppeteers. They had an imaginative way of the plant eating its victims too. Instead of the victim being chomped in the plant's jaws, two puppeteers would wrap vines around the victim, who would then fall down through a trap door into the plant. At Regent's Park Outdoor Theatre in 2018, there was no puppet. Instead, the plant was played by a green, lycra-clad drag queen, Vicky Vox, who was able to prowl the set. When a victim was consumed, they would be concealed by a shutter closing in front of them. In the 2019 Pasadena Playhouse production, the plant remained a small puppet, but its tendrils were manoeuvred by actors in full black costumes on a darkly lit set using the Japanese Kuroko technique. They would surround a victim who would be dragged off into the darkness. There are many ways to create one strange and interesting plant. Going back to the great music, it was Little Shop of Horrors that launched the career of Ashman and Menken. 
They had previously worked together on God Bless You, Mr Rosewater, an adaptation of Kurt Vonnegut's novel. It opened in 1979 to excellent reviews, but modest box office takings. Little Shop, however, was the one that changed both their lives. Disney became interested in the pair off the back of the success of not only the stage musical, but also the movie, and hired the duo to write the music for The Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid film would go on to earn Disney over $235 million worldwide and was largely credited with breathing life back into Disney animated feature films. Ashman and Menken went on to write the music for Beauty and the Beast and then Aladdin, although Howard Ashman died before Aladdin was completed and Tim Rice stepped in to complete the lyrics. Menken went on to provide the music for countless other Disney animations, live action films and stage musicals. He currently holds the record for the most Oscar wins of any living person, with eight. Although Walt Disney himself is the all-time record holder, with 22. Menken is also one of only 16 people ever to have achieved the EGOT, winning an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar and Tony Award. Alan Menken is now reportedly worth $100 million and apparently earns between $5 and $10 million just in royalties per year. And all that, arguably, started with one strange and interesting plant on Skid Row 40 years ago. Our backstage pass holder, John O'Neill, has been talking to the actor playing the part of Audrey Two in Little Shop of Horrors. It's got to be one of the best costume calls ever. You don't need to get ready. You don't need to be in costume. No makeup, no wigs. But on the other hand, you're not seen. That's got to be a bit of a challenge. John, tell us more. Thanks, Liz. Little Shop of Horrors is running from Saturday the 30th of April for seven days here at the Crescent Theatre. It's a main house musical production with a live orchestra and an all singing and dancing cast. For today's backstage pass, I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast two performers involved in the Crescent Theatre's upcoming production, Jenny Thurston and Mark Walsh. Welcome both. Hello. (laughs) Thank you very much for having us. You're welcome. Um, Jenny, we'll start with you, if you don't mind. Your character has been described as an anthropomorphic cross between a Venus flytrap and an avocado. But you're not an actor, are you? Um, no, not in this one, uh, nor am I an avocado. But um, yeah, basically I'm the puppeteer um, that helps bring to life the said Venus flytrap slash alien slash avocado. So <laughs> how how does that work then on stage? Are we? Is it glove puppets or what kind of puppetry mm-hmm. is it? Yeah, over the years it's kind of evolved a bit, um, as the sh- uh, not the present show, but as the show's been around. And the original Avocado has had a few reincarnations, and our one is based mainly on Muppet-type puppets. Right. Um, and then various clever bits and pieces of scenery, which I'm not going to give too much away. Right, yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to give anything away, fair enough. And this is this your first foray into puppetry? Um, No, it's something I've weirdly been really into since, yeah, I was very small and uh, people have foolishly always allowed me to have a go. (laughs) So, yeah, it's stuff that I've done on and off for years and really enjoy. Cool. And uh, what was the first puppet you ever had? Did you have them as a child? Oh, gosh, yeah. I had, like, the marionettes, the string ones, and then I started making myself some Muppet-type puppets, which is most of the kind of puppetry I've done over the years in theatre or for um, CBeebies and things like that. And what's the most sort of memorable puppet that you've oh gosh i'm probably going to say this one actually because he's he's really good fun and really badly behaved so you get to get away with an awful lot and yeah because i'm working with mark it's not just me bringing it to life it's really really good fun and really creative so yeah at the minute it's it's audrey (laughs) and and do you have to have quite flexible hands (laughs) yeah you have to have quite strong hands um yeah because of being able to control the different mouths kind of shapes and openings and and yeah puppets themselves are quite heavy because you spend all your time with your arm above your head Um, so yeah yeah, you don't get into an arm wrestle with a puppeteer (laughs) basically and so you must have quite strong arms if they're reaching up all the time yeah, you get yeah, you do get quite a good muscle tone <laughs> whether you want it yeah. or not. <laughs> and do you ever use puppets with animatronics, or is it just all with your hands? Yeah, no. I in the last sort of 
kind of five six years yeah i've been doing a lot um a lot of the children's television has animatronics in it now just to give get them to smile or the eyebrows to raise they're quite simple yeah but um yeah the two together plus a voice artist is yeah another it's another great fun because it's three of you doing it um and yeah you spend a lot of time watching what it will do because obviously the big thing with puppetry is you can't see what the puppet's yeah. doing yeah. unless you've got mirrors or or whatever so a lot of it is yeah you have to kind of it's muscle memory mm. you have to sort of watch it play with it work with mirrors talk to people like the wonderful mark and say do you like this do you not like this yeah. and then remember it differently remember how it feels in your body and how it feels in your hand and, and just keep practicing like that really well, that's fascinating because i never thought of that because if you're an actor you know when you're smiling you you know and you know when you're looking mm -hmm. sad mm -hmm. you know i know there's more to it than that but i suppose of course with a puppet you, the only feeling you've got is is what you're doing with your hand or what what the controls are doing on the animatronics and you don't it's you have to learn how to know that yeah. that is the expression you want to make yeah exactly yeah it's very it's very like acting in that you have to do all your sort of background work and your re and yeah and work out why you're sad and therefore how sad you'd be and all the rest of yeah. it but yeah instead of with actors where you'd then feel it in your body you do do that as a puppeteer but you've got to learn to express it through literally the contorted shape of your hand or the fact your shoulder's going i don't want to be up in the air anymore <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And, and so you, you sort of in a way that an actor learns character or, or determines the character for their part it's the same is true of a puppet i'd imagine yeah yeah good puppet work is and the fun puppet work is yeah it's not just like opening and closing a mouth it's exactly what you do for an actor yeah um, yeah the performing so it, even down to body why. language you know and yeah with puppets 99 percent of their performance is body language because they are restricted they haven't got the complex facial muscles mm. and things that we have but you still people still react to them in the same way they want to read their body language so yeah it's all body language so if it's sad you will lean forward if it's happy it will suddenly shoot you like up or something like that and yeah that's what you've got really to rely on to convey exactly how sad or how happy or what's going on with it and then this is why this one's fun because mark's voice is brilliant um and he will obviously speak the lines with as much care as an actor would but you've also can do the subtleties of body language where say maybe the plant's saying something but he's trying to manipulate by mm. meaning something else yeah. so yeah exactly that's then becomes about will my wrist do that um yeah and how would we like to do that <laughs> god it's so interesting i'd never really considered the depth of puppetry before it's something you just sort of take at face mm. value you know but actually it's not it's not a simple thing and mark you two are involved with bringing this mutant plant audrey to to life is that right yes we certainly are yes um so as Jenny's mentioned, I am the voice of Audrey 2, which means for the majority of the show, I think I'm going to be locked away <laughs> elsewhere, <laughs> not being able to interact with the rest of the <laughs> cast, which is a bit of a shame. But it means that we can isolate my vocals away from the general sounds of the theatre, being a work in theatre, there's lots of different sounds around. I think it's an ongoing debate as to where I'll right. be. Yeah. Um, You're going to end I, up at home, aren't you, doing Yeah, I think so, in. just zooming <laughs> over. Yeah. No. Um, it, it, it's nice because it's not just the puppet work, is it? We do get mm -hmm. to appear on stage yeah. at a certain point right. in the show. So, okay. yeah. obviously, we, we, we get to have a bit of fun in those roles as well. Um, but then the majority of our work is unseen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, maybe you'll have a monitor as well in the same way. that The cast have a monitor of the conductor mm -hmm. of the orchestra, don't they? So they can yeah. sing in time, in time to the music, which helps. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So um, how are you both approaching the role? Are there any aspects that you're emphasising and how are you doing that? So y y you've mentioned how um, misbehaved... Um, the the plant is um so we we are playing on that quite quite well we've given as much sass as possible it's something very easy to do with body language is sass yeah so that that is one of the main aspects of the character is he is very sassy he's very um very almost aggressive in his tone yeah. towards cocky. Seymour. Cocky, would you say cocky? Cocky's a good word, mm. yes. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't say cocky, no. but um, <laughs> you, you, I'll, I'll let you. <laughs> um, no, he's, he's, he's absolutely fabulous 
the plant. I don't think he appreciates being called an avocado, so no more of that, please. Yeah, I'm sure he'd uh, <laughs> probably literally bite my head off. <laughs> yeah. oh, excellent. And the, 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 the audience will only see one character, but there are two people bringing it to life. Yeah. So what are the challenges of that? Um, Especially considering you're going to be in a box nowhere near yes. where Jenny has her hand <laughs> manipulating a puppet. So, yes, that is the biggest challenge, is the fact that we're not going to have eye contact yeah. throughout it. Mm -hmm. But we've been discussing the role and we've been going away and practising on our own mm -hmm. in order to almost help each other out the lip syncing is is one of the harder things because even if we could see each other if mark speaks i'm late <laughs> and vice versa if i open the mouth before mark's speaking so um yeah as mark said we've just been working really really closely which is really great team plant is just yeah how would mark like to say it what could i offer as an option for the puppet and exactly yeah working on the sass is great because it, it gives it a lot more fullness to just saying lines um, and it allows us to have quite sharp mood changes and things based yeah. on yeah mark's really good range but it's yeah it's just about getting to know probably in more detail than you normally would what your partner's going to do yeah. so and getting used to like how mark breathes how he's got when if he makes a certain noise and i kind of know where he's going i know where that's going to go yeah. and, and vice versa so mark's you'll need to, to kind of know the rhythm of yes. the lines that he's going to deliver um i would say it's it's a lovely change to not have to learn the lines because i will have the book in front of me oh, just right. so i don't go yeah. off book yeah on the other hand Jenny's not saying the lines, but you have to learn mm -hmm. the lines yeah. in order to, to do it because you're not going to have a light no. underneath, <laughs> see anything. Not see underneath anything. the puppet yeah, yeah. with you. So um, while on the one hand that is lovely for me, it's <laughs> a new challenge for you, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah, because that's the other thing as well. It's not just us trying to perform one character. Obviously, Mark even if he had the best monitor in the world, is not with people. And I can't see anything from inside the puppet, so a lot of the movement has to be timed. We have to know, have agreed with the other cast members how yeah. it's going to go. And there's little bits of push and pull lights and a lot of the vocal noises and things Mark can use to sort of warm me off. It's, you know, so we don't have to be absolutely like on the split second every time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's absolutely right. There, because When you're working as tightly in a team, there comes a point where you've got to agree on one course of action that the team's going to follow. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, it's choreographed to a great extent. Yeah, yeah. that's probably the, yeah, the best word for yeah. it, yeah. And yeah. I can't believe, Mark, that you get to read your lines. That's, <laughs> that's not fair. It is, it is lovely. <laughs> um, such, a, such a change from the last show I was in here, which was Blackadder, where they were very adamant that the lines had to be perfect. Yeah, book down, perfect book down, and, book down. Um, so you book down does not apply to book you. Book down does not apply yeah, to well, me. It's lovely. Yeah, well, That's brilliant. Up. <laughs> Fair play. Uh, now, Little Shop of Horrors seems to be more popular than ever. What is it that keeps audiences coming back? Oh, well, it's one of those that has a bit of a timeless charm to it, I would say. Yeah, yeah and what about the, the music? Yeah, the, I think the music definitely adds because it's, it's a cracking score. It's really yeah. difficult. I mean, if you ask any of the cast, it's because we've all essentially got our own line. It's like eight part harmonies at times. But I think, yeah, the music is actually a very, very clever score. And that added with the story, as Mark said. And yeah, the, the puppets are incredibly engaging, particularly a giant one that starts consuming people. Um, the whole thing is just really, really layered, like technically, but also, you know, you can you can enjoy it on one level of, oh, this is fun. There's people with a giant part in B-movie style. There's cultural references in there. You could go right into the deep dark of like capitalism, which it does actually touch mm -hmm. on in a big way and, yeah. and the whole yeah. you know the whole Skid Row song about yeah. serving you know the rich people and it, it's got so much in it and it's got it goes at such a cracking pace yeah. that I think that's true yeah for me I think that's possibly what it's enduring you know pull is is that there's so much in it and it's just one of those pieces of theatre magic where it just seems every element's just really started to come together and make it work yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's a number of reasons. And it's wonderfully yeah. wacky as well. Yeah, exactly. It's wonderfully wacky <laughs> and quite bloodthirsty, and yes. audiences like that. Yes, yeah. definitely. It, it's it's my favourite genre, <laughs> camp. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hence the sass. <laughs> <laughs> or the cockiness, however you want to put it. Uh, so it's roughly a month to go until opening night. 
Oh, don't say that. <laughs> How are rehearsals going and what will you be rehearsing today? <laughs> yeah, no, they are going really well. We've got that stage where, like, you know, you feel like you level up where it suddenly goes up a gear yes. and then it also makes you go, oh my goodness, I've yes. got to go up another gear. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're at that really good stage where, yeah, it's starting to come together. Um, to be honest, the cast are just such fun. Mm, it's a really yeah. fun show, but the people that are, yeah, working on this are just really out for hard work but fun. Mm. So it's really making a difference. And, yeah, they, we're kind of, I think they're going really well. So it's a nice tight crack cast yeah. yeah and they're really individual characters and paths it's like it's you know you've, you've kind of got to hold your own really so mm. yeah it, i think it's going yeah it's going really well from where i'm sitting <laughs> and, and what will <laughs> you be doing part. today do you know um i believe we're we're running bits of act one so we're kind of like running all the acts now it's it's it although it has got distinct parts to it it's easier now to just barrel in and sit sort of like run yeah, and then, yeah. then go back and start pulling it apart and when you first start doing it because i've never been in a musical when you first start doing it, do you separate out the choreography and separate out the singing and separate out the straight action shall we say and do all that separately for, to begin with yeah yes right. yeah, exactly yeah, definitely. What you do. um i think the the way it's been directed this time it was really lovely to go away and learn all of the music before we actually did a read through of the show right. because it meant when we actually got together to do the read through we could sing it all with the harmonies and we got to hear how it should sit, sound mm. without listening to the soundtrack yeah. we were listening to ourselves do it mm. and it was it was really nice to feel it all coming together at such an early stage in the rehearsal process because normally you just do a read through mm. and you may sing along to the soundtracks but this time it was everything is together um yeah. choreography came directly after that so it all just came together really fast and finally regular listeners to the podcast will most definitely know that we like to propagate verdant lush well-fed and fully fertilized trivia so May I present to you both, be germinated or be terminated. The term B-movie is used to refer to low-budget films, which were originally used to fill the less publicised half of a double-feature format. From the following, can you guess which of these B-movie titles, B-germinated, were real, or are B-terminated? which are made up by our wonderful podcast team. Say, germinated for real <laughs> and terminated for fake. OK, so that's germinated or terminated. I'm going to start with Jenny. Poultrygeist, the night of the chicken dead. Is that germinated or terminated. I don't want that to be real, but I'm going to say terminated. <clears throat> it's a germinated. Yeah, it's real. Like... <laughs> Zombified chickens attempt to kill the fast food workers that cook them in a restaurant. And the restaurant was built on an ancient burial ground, so it all makes sense. And that's actually quite recent, 2006. Yeah, that one was a true story. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, this one's for you. Death bed. The bed that eats. Is that germinated or terminated? Oh, well, I, th I think that does happen in, in Nightmare on Elm Street, doesn't it? Um, I'm going to say terminated. <coughs> germinated. It's a real one. A bed possessed by a demon spirit consumes its users alive. And that's from 1977. You're both doing very badly so far. You're on zero each. I'm getting a great list of stuff to watch. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought when I first read this list. Poultrygeist sounds great. Anyway, number three, Jenny, this mm -hmm. is your chance to redeem yourself. Revenge of the Killer Dentures. Is that germinated or terminated? Oh, <laughs> I'm going to go with... Terminated? Correct. Hey. One point, you are in the lead. Mark, the giant claw. Germinated or terminated? Oh, I'm, I'm going germinated first. Correct. Time. Yes. Germinated. Global panic ensues when it is revealed that a mysterious UFO is actually a giant bird. 
that flies at supersonic speed and has no regard for life or architecture. <laughs> and that is from 1957. I don't know if that trumps Poultry Geist or not, but that's, yeah, that's another one to watch. <laughs> it's got a lot of model work in there. Um, so, <laughs> did you get that right? I've forgotten. Yes. Yeah, you did. One point each, mm, right, yes. all to play for. <laughs> Jenny, this is for you. The Splurgy. Germinated or terminated? I want that to be true, so I'm going to go with germinated. <laughs> terminated, I'm afraid. So, this, Mark, if you oh. get this now, you've won. It's a loss of pressure. You ready? <laughs> I bought... A vampire motorcycle. Is that germinated or terminated? I think I might want to use my phone a friend. Um, <laughs> I am going... Final answer? No, sorry, you haven't said it yet. No. Germinated. Correct. Yes! Point to you. You are the winner. When a motorbike gang kills an occultist... The evil spirit he was summoning inhabits a damaged bike. The bike is then bought and restored, but reveals its true nature when it tries to exact vengeance on the gang and anyone else that gets in its way. So, oh, there you go. two points to one point. Wow. Mark, you are the king of trivia for episode nine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jenny. Thank, thank you. you, Mark. Thank you. We've had a wonderful time, and I implore all of our listeners to come and see Little Shop of Horrors very soon at the Crescent Theatre. Thank you both. Thank you for listening to the Amateur of Life and Death podcast. If you'd like to listen to more, make sure you subscribe at podcast.crescent-theatre.co.uk or via Spotify, Google or Apple Podcasts to get the next episode. You can find out more about the Crescent Theatre Birmingham and our upcoming productions, including Little Shop of Horrors, by visiting www.crescent-theatre.co.uk or by following us on social media. Amateur of Life and Death is a Crescent Theatre production. It's presented by Luke Plimmer, Liz Plumpton and John O'Neill. It's been researched and edited by Kevin Middleton and the music is by Brendan Stanley.